The vicious cordyceps infection turning humans into terrifyingly fast zombies keeps spreading with ferocity across the globe, but that's no longer your biggest threat. There are bloodthirsty survivors at every turn, ready to rob you blind and stab you in the throat. How can you ever hope to survive? I'm here to break down the successes, failures, and how to beat the apocalypse survivors in The Last of Us Season 1 Part 2. Three months after surviving the harrowing horde attack in Kansas City, Joel and Ellie have made their way to Wyoming. They've become lost in the snow-covered woods, so they make a stop in an isolated cabin where an older couple lives. After separately interrogating the couple, Joel finds out they're very close to where he suspects Tommy lives. The couple warn Joel and Ellie not to venture beyond the nearby river, as those who do have yet to come back. Something worse than the infected reside there. As they leave the couple's cabin, Joel slows and grabs at his chest, having trouble breathing and experiencing heart palpitations. After a moment, they dissipate, and he continues on, not explaining his pains to Ellie. Joel and Ellie venture forward, trekking on foot through the forest. One night while camping, Ellie asks Joel what he most desires to do after the apocalypse is cured. He would own a sheep ranch and live in solitude, he explains. Ellie, on the other hand, says she wants to visit the moon. Then she reveals her doubt that a vaccine can be created from her blood, after she failed to stop Sam from becoming infected in Kansas City. Joel reassures her that the Fireflies know what they are doing. The next day, when they approach the forewarned river, a gang of weapon-saddled horseback riders surround them. A man demands to know their intentions, which Joel lies about in order to conceal Ellie's purpose as the potential cure to the cordyceps infection. A dog is released to sniff out if either of them have been bitten, and Joel tenses up to fight the gang as the dog nears Ellie, but she distracts it with pets and kisses. Then, the leader stops the hostilities to ask Joel his name. Hearing it, she takes him and Ellie into their camp. Their camp is a fortified town in the mountains. As they pass to the center, Joel spots Tommy working on repairing a building. Tommy rushes down, and they are reunited. Maria, the horseback leader, takes the group inside the mess hall to eat. It's there that Joel finds out that Tommy and Maria are married. The couple take them on a tour, revealing that the town was previously a gated community that was abandoned in 2003 after the Cordyceps outbreak. Seven years prior, Maria and a group of others began settling the area. It is home to more than 300 people. The government operates as a communist system, with Maria being one of the elected board members. The residents must keep to themselves, however, so as to not attract unwanted attention and invite raiding on the commune. Maria takes Ellie to clean up, as Tommy and Joel discuss their lives of the past several years. Joel confronts Tommy about his radio silence. After leaving the Fireflies, Tommy was rescued by the Communists, who insisted that he remain as reclusive as possible to keep the Commune safe. He reveals that he and Maria are expecting a child, so he lives his entire life much more cautiously, which has led him to losing contact with his brother. Joel cannot bring himself to congratulate Tommy on his expected child, instead promising to leave in the morning with Ellie. He storms out of the bar, but then begins to experience heart palpitations again. He sees a girl who looks like his daughter, which calms his pains. Ellie finishes getting showered and changed, and meets Maria who offers her a haircut. As the two talk, Ellie brings up a small memorial in the house for two deceased children. Maria explains that one of them was her child, the other was Joel's. After seeing Ellie process this new information, Maria warns her to be careful who she puts her faith in. That evening, Joel and Tommy talk in secret. Joel asks his brother to take over his mission to deliver Ellie for him. Their new plan is to head a few days further west to an abandoned Colorado university where fireflies have supposedly staked out. But Joel is plagued by fears of failing Ellie and memories of his daughter's death in his arms, which Joel witnessed. He explains Ellie's true purpose to Tommy, who reluctantly agrees to take her in the morning. Joel goes to Ellie's room to tell her the new plan, but she overheard the conversation between him and Tommy. They argue about it, but ultimately Joel walks out, content with his decision. That night, he again dreams of his dead daughter. The next morning, Ellie and Tommy head to the stables where they meet Joel. He explains he came to steal a horse and leave before the others so as to avoid saying goodbye, but feels he owes Ellie a choice of guardian. She immediately chooses him over Tommy, and they say their goodbyes before heading out. After several days, Joel and Ellie make it to Colorado. They find the Banning University, but only traces of the Fireflies, not the actual Rebels. They search the building, seeing damaged medical equipment and a scribbled packing list. Alarmed by a noise from upstairs, they head towards it and find only some wild testing monkeys. Looking around, they discover a map pinned to a corkboard and deduce the Rebels headed to Salt Lake City. That's when survivors hear a noise and look out the window to see a gang of four raiders heading into their building. They sneak out back, but as soon as they get to their horse, a raider charges at them. He swings a baseball bat at Joel, who dodges it, and it breaks against a tree. 
Joel tackles the attacker into a chokehold as Ellie aims her gun. Joel snaps the man's neck and drops his body, but then they notice the broken bat lodged into Joel's abdomen. He pulls it out and stumbles towards the horse as the other three raiders charge their way. Jumping onto the animal, Joel spurs it off as Ellie fires at the attackers. They manage to get away swiftly. Later, the horse slows down near a train track. Joel falls off and becomes wounded on the ground. Now, before we get too deep into the series, I feel like I should address the elephant in the room. Joel, despite being almost a decade into a horrified post-apocalyptic hellscape, maintains a perfectly imperfect, disheveled salt and pepper facial hair situation. If I had to guess how the daddy of all daddies is able to achieve such a momentous thing, I would be willing to go out on a limb and say he's using the Beard Hedger Pro Kit from Manscaped. If there's any beautiful beard trimmer that can survive an onslaught of murderous mushrooms, it's the trimmer with a powerful 7,200 RPM motor and titanium coated T-blades that can cut through the thickest of hair in a single stroke. This beard trimmer is waterproof, cordless, and rechargeable, so it's surely the most apocalypse-proof trimmer on the market. You can choose from 20 different hair cutting lengths with the zoom wheel that uses only one guard that won't pull or nick your neck, a very important thing when antibiotics are in short supply and infection can be fatal. The Beard Hedger Pro Kit not only includes the Hedger though, it also has beard shampoo, beard container, beard conditioner, beard oil, beard balm, a travel case perfect for traversing the wasteland, and a free gift, beard accessories including beard brush, beard comb, and beard scissors. Go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off your own Beard Hedger Pro Kit, plus free shipping when you use promo code HOWTOBEAT at checkout. Now back to the apocalypse. Ellie tries to suppress the bleeding, but finds herself hopeless as Joel slips out of consciousness. Okay, Joel is on the verge of truly sacrificing his life for Ellie's survival. That's a noble move, but an unplanned one. It may be even unnecessary had different choices been made prior to this trek to Colorado. Ellie's choice to go with Joel instead of Tommy to Colorado is one made purely out of emotion. It's not a bad choice per se, but could have been more rationally made. Joel is very clear about his shortcomings and fear of failure. While not all of this is inherently irrational either, it should still be taken more carefully into consideration. Joel has been capable of protecting Ellie so far, though there have been half a dozen close calls. She also trusts him, which is a valuable connection she does not share with Tommy, having just met him the day before. As Joel expresses doubts about his ability to continue providing for Ellie, the safest choice becomes a team-up between the brothers. Though Tommy does not truly want a journey to Colorado, it seems he's willing to do so out of compassion for his brother. Joel cannot bring himself to abandon Ellie either, so all three of them should make the journey, right? This provides lots of advantages for everyone. The presence of three people with weapons and training offers more safety than only two. If the journey was as safe as Tommy promised Joel it would be, then this is over planning. But if the journey proves more dangerous, this could save someone's life. Once the group reaches the university and discovers that the Fireflies have fled the scene, it would be much more challenging for the Raiders to injure anyone. Simple math in this scenario puts the fight as three against four, rather than two against four. The group would likely still be able to sneak out of the building, but when the Raider comes to attack, he will have to battle both Joel and Tommy. One of them could disarm the Raider, while the other tackles him. As a team that has previously murdered people together, Joel and Tommy understand each other's methods and mannerisms. In a flight or fight scenario, this is invaluable. Even prior to being attacked by the Raiders, having another person to keep watch while the university is explored. After the attack, Tommy does not need to continue on with Ellie and Joel to Salt Lake City. Though this would continue to benefit them, he could return to Maria having saved his brother's life. Back at the commune, Joel explained Ellie's importance to the survival of humanity, so if Ellie were to ask, it's almost a given that Tommy would come along. It's too bad she doesn't. On their own, their sneaking out of the building leads to Joel only having to fend off one raider rather than the group. This is a much smarter idea than attempting to hide from the gang, which would have meant staying indoors and limiting escape routes. Had Ellie shot the attacking raider as soon as he appeared, he would have at least been stalled in swinging the baseball bat. The immediacy of the attack threw everyone off, allowing the man time to swing and miss and turn his blunt instrument into a ship. Joel should have tried to defend himself in a way that allowed there to be more space between him and the man, rather than attacking him. This space would have allowed himself, but more likely Ellie to fire at the raider and hopefully take him out without stabbing anyone. Once someone has a sharp instrument, it becomes imperative to stay away. The raider's swing and miss with a bat did turn the weapon more deadly, but also limited its use to something even closer range. When Joel attacked, he should have focused on the weapon in the raider's hand. Disarming him is more important than fully neutralizing him at this moment. 
Joel obviously wants to preserve as much of Ellie's innocence as possible by not forcing her to kill people, but exceptions must be made. Her shot would not even need to be fatal, as Joel proves himself capable of killing someone without a weapon. She would only need to inflict enough pain to distract the man long enough to be disarmed and left in the dust. Ellie drags Joel into a house near the train tracks, leading the horse into the basement as well. Ellie tries to apply pressure to his stab wound as Joel weakly pushes her away. He can barely speak, but tells her to leave him to die, insisting she go and find Tommy. Ignoring him, she races through the house looking for medical supplies, but is reminded of her past. In the time prior to meeting Joel, Ellie lived in the quarantine zone of Boston under the supervision of Fedra. She got bullied by some of the other girls, which often ended her up in trouble with the captain, and he attempted to get Ellie to fall in line by showing her the future she can have as a Fedra leader. That night, Ellie moped in her room, but her friend Riley snuck into the room. She disappeared several weeks before, leading everyone to assume she was dead. As Ellie confronted her about her whereabouts, Riley admitted that she joined the Fireflies. They argued about the morals of the rebel group, with Ellie thinking they're nothing but selfish terrorists, preventing Fedra from restoring peace. Riley insisted they go on a trip together until she finally convinced Ellie to join her for an adventure. Begrudgingly, Ellie followed Riley out of the room and across town. On the way through Boston, they came across a dead body from which they stole a bottle of liquor before the corpse fell through the decaying building's floor. On the rooftop, they shared the liquor. Then, Riley pointed out a mall which Ellie refused to enter because of rumors of an infected horde inside. Riley assured her of its safety and that there are four wonders she will show her tonight. They climbed down through a hole in the ceiling, entering the control room. Riley turned on the power in the building, lighting up the decrepit mall. It's the most amazing thing Ellie has seen, and the girl is blown away by an escalator, proclaiming it the fifth wonder of them all. As Riley leads Ellie to the first stop, they pass by a lingerie store. They discuss the overconsumption of the 2000s. Before the cordyceps mutated, Riley makes a flirty comment about imagining Ellie in the lingerie. Ellie is guided to a carousel, which amazes her. The two girls got on to ride the horses and shared longing glances. Riley began to talk again about the Firefly Rebellion, explaining how they have taken power back for the people in some cities. Ellie asked her to come back and rejoin Fedra to restore peace that way. Riley revealed that before running away, she found out what her Fedra job assignment would be, sewage duty. She would be resigned to overseeing menial tasks with Fedra, but with the Fireflies, she was given responsibility and meaning. She won't return to being overlooked. They moved on to the next wonder of the mall, a photo booth. Inside, they gave stupid poses for the camera. Even though the photo strip was printed in faded ink, Ellie kept it anyway. The third wonder of the mall was the arcade. It's here that Riley and Ellie duked it out playing Mortal Kombat over and over, Ellie slowly getting better at defeating Riley. Elsewhere in the mall, a load infected was awakened by the noise. After the arcade, they moved into a storage room where Riley had been camping out for the past weeks. She gave Ellie a gift, a book of puns. Then, Ellie notices a small supply of handmade explosives in the corner and realized Riley was fully committed to the Firefly's cause. Riley quickly defended the movement, saying she would never allow them to bomb anywhere near Ellie and never let her be hurt. But Ellie knew there was no way for Riley to secure this. She was just a lowly player in the rebellion. The girl walks away, but her friend follows after her and reveals that tonight was her last night in Boston before being relocated tomorrow to a new Firefly post. She tried convincing her boss Marlene to allow Ellie to come, but the woman refused to let her join. Heartbroken, Ellie stormed out of the mall. As she almost made it to the exit, she decided to turn back and see her best friend one final time, but then she heard screaming. Running through the maze of displays, she came upon a Halloween store. A mechanical toy made the screams, but Ellie finds Riley curled up by the display. She moved to comfort her, saying how much she'll miss her. Riley attempted to redeem the night with a final wonder, and the two donned masks and danced on the display case. As they got closer, Ellie stopped dancing and took off her mask. Riley did the same and the girl asked her not to go. This time, Riley agreed and they kissed. Just as they parted lips, a crashing sound alerted them to something heading their way. At that moment, an infected burst into the store. Riley fired her pistol at it, knocking it down and giving them time to run. But the infected quickly caught up to them and pounced on Riley, knocking her down. Ellie grappled with the creature, stabbing it repeatedly in the side before being cornered against the display case. Riley regained her footing, grabbed a metal rod, and began to attack the monster. Using the distraction, Ellie impaled the creature's head with her pocket knife, killing it. She looked towards Riley to celebrate their victory, but Riley only stared at Ellie's arm. The creature bit her. Then, she holds up her own bite on her hand. Ellie began destroying the store as Riley sank to the floor in defeat. Finally, Ellie joins her, and the two discuss their options. Either they take the easy way out, or wait until they turn into monsters together. Riley quickly throws out the first plan. Instead, they hold each other tight as they brace for their bodies to turn against them. In 2023, Ellie races through the house, searching for anything to help her stop Joel's bleeding. 
finally she finds a needle and thread in a drawer and rushes back down to Joel. He can barely move as she uncovers his stab wound and begins to stitch it back together. In a building somewhere in the wintry Colorado landscape, a man reads from the Bible to a group of mourners. He comforts a crying girl, assuring her that God will dry her tears and there will be no suffering for the dead. The girl asks when they can bury her father's body, which the man, David, says cannot happen until the spring when the ground is softer. The funeral disbands and David talks with his right-hand man, James, outside. James expresses the people's concerns over their diminishing food supply and makes it clear they're afraid, but David assures them he will find a way out if they stick with him. As the days pass, Joel's condition worsens. Ellie is running out of food. She takes matters into her own hands, using Joel's rifle to go hunting. In the snowy woods, she spots a deer grazing some yards away. She creeps into position, slows her breathing, and fires. The deer is hit, but manages to run away. Ellie follows its blood trail through the forest, but she doesn't get to the animal first. David and James find the deer corpse near an abandoned building and debate if they should try to steal it before the hunter comes along. Before they can take action, Ellie comes out from the trees, rifle aimed at their heads, yelling at them to back away. David begins to negotiate. He explains his tribe is starving and that they will be glad to trade supplies for some of the deer meat. Ellie lies that she's from a large group in need, but also sees a chance to save Joel, so she agrees to split the carcass in exchange for medicine. David takes the deal and instructs James to head back to town and get penicillin for her. After James leaves, David offers to build a fire while they wait. Ellie instructs him to drag the animal inside the building, then stokes the flame. Inside the shack, David tries to question Ellie about her situation, but she refuses refuses to divulge anything. He tells her about how he found religion after the apocalypse. He never wanted to lead the group, but they elected him and set on their journey after their quarantine zone fell. Ellie questions his belief that everything happens for a reason, but he counters with an example. A few weeks prior, he sent a group of four to a nearby Colorado town to search for food. Only three came back, claiming the fourth member had been murdered by a man traveling with a young girl. Ellie realizes he means Joel and her, but before she can react, he yells to James to lower his gun. Ellie whips around to see he's returned and is ready to kill her. David commands James to lower his gun and give Ellie the medicine. She takes it and runs off, leaving the deer carcass behind. James questions David's intent, but the man already has a plan. Ellie hurries back to Joel and frantically tries to decipher how to use the penicillin. She administers some right into his wound and then lays down next to him. In the town, dinner is prepared for the survivors there, and a man brings in a container of meat. The cook questions its contents, but he assures her it's venison. Thinking nothing of it, she adds it to the stew, with no idea it's human flesh. David and James drag the deer into the mess hall. The rest of the group looks on with confusion. The pastor confirms the rumors of Joel and Ellie, making it clear they'll be hunted down tomorrow. The murdered father's child shouts that they should kill the pair, but David walks over to the table, shoving her out of the chair, then sits for dinner and eats the stew. Meanwhile, Ellie administers Joel another penis shot and gives the horse water, but as she's taking in the scenery, she sees a flock of nearby birds flying away. It's a sign somebody has come, and she sneaks outside to survey the danger, spotting David's group of hunters. Terrified, she runs back down to the basement where she's keeping Joel. Giving him a knife, she tries to wake him, but he can barely open his eyes. She tells him of the danger and that she will try to lead the hunters away from here, but he must defend himself if anyone finds him. She goes back upstairs and blocks the basement door with furniture. She mounts her horse and comes upon the group from behind. She fires her pistol at them and gallops away, while David instructs the group to capture her alive. The men scatter and Ellie rides through the neighborhood, exchanging gunfire. One of the men shoots her horse, throwing Ellie off and knocking her near the unconscious. The men come over, and David and James take Ellie back to town, while the others stay to look for Joel. Okay, run Ellie, run. Ellie is more on her own than she's ever been. With Joel near the comatose in the basement, she has to use only her wits to save the both of them. When Ellie met David and James the day before, she made a good deal to get penicillin for Joel. Getting the penicillin was a double-edged sword in many ways. Yes, she could save Joel's life, but as a side effect of the trade, she had to spend an uncomfortable amount of time with David. This was her only viable option to prevent Joel's death. Simply waiting on him to naturally recover would not have worked in their favor. Unfortunately, she also lost all the deer meat and alerted David to her and Joel's existence. However, these were not wasted moments. They provided her with crucial information, though she didn't have the forethought to use it. David's comments about the death of their group member whom Joel killed should have been a flashing siren to Ellie that danger was on her doorstep, especially once David let her go with the medicine, and this move makes little practical sense. David's cult is suffering and short on supplies. A tactful leader would find a way to get the deer for food and keep the medicine for whenever it's needed. Had Ellie been able to assess the situation from a calmer vantage, she would have seen that she had far from seen the last of David. Knowing this, she should have spent the night preparing. Joel has a map that he's been using throughout his journey. 
while Ellie is not the most skilled with maps, as we learned right before things took a sharp turn towards the gutter in Kansas City, she has some competency. When David offers to make Ellie a fire while they wait for the penicillin, he mentions that the walk about to town is about four miles. Using Joel's map, Ellie can look for all the possible towns within the radius from her position. She can also plan an escape route. While she's only got her best guess right now as to the precise location of David and his gang, understanding the distance they're willing to travel for their revenge is enough to spur her own movement. If she had paid enough attention to James's trip to get the penicillin, she could even estimate how fast the group coming to kill her would be. Of course, Joel can't be left for dead, but that's where the horse comes in. The hardest method of transporting Joel would be to get him on the horse, though once he's mounted, this will be the fastest method. Still, it requires Ellie to move him out of the basement and lift him onto horseback. Unless there's a secret levee in the house, that's not happening. Instead, she could fashion a sort of sled out of the mattress Joel is sleeping on, or a chair or other furniture from any of these neighborhood houses. Attach the sled to the back of the horse and you're in business. A potential snag of this plan is that if Ellie drags Joel's body behind the horse, there will be noticeable tracks making it easier for David and his followers to find them. She can counter this in a few ways. First, she could attach a branch or other natural materials to the shed. These will drag across the ground and overturn the snow in a more natural way, hopefully making the tracks harder to spot. Second, every few yards, Ellie could dismount the horse, then overturn the tracks in the snow herself, again with a branch or other tools. Either of these methods would only be necessary until they make it out of the neighborhood. Once they reach the woods, the trail will become much harder to pick up since there are no longer wide open stretches of undisturbed snow. Finally, Ellie could simply not worry about turning over the snow at all and focus on making as much headway against the attackers as possible. The snowfall during the night might help prevent such easy tracking, but this plan is the flimsiest of all. Presumably, Ellie and Joel are also not far from the train tracks where Joel collapsed from blood loss. They can use these to their advantage. If Ellie can transport Joel to the train tracks, getting away will be much easier. The tracks provide a completely clear and direct pathway for them to get the hell out of Dodge. David and his followers might assume Ellie would take the train track because of its convenience. However, the horse's tracks would be harder to notice on a railroad. Plus, the mattress Joel is sleeping on is likely just smaller than the width of the tracks. This would allow for easy, albeit bumpy passage, with Joel's mattress dragging behind the horse and smoothing out its tracks. The railroad will eventually lead to somewhere safer, and the bumpy nature of this or any of the methods of travel will likely help wake Joel up. If worse came to worse for Ellie, and she was unable able to move Joel, she could still fight off her attackers. Getting them as far away from Joel as possible is the right move, but could be executed differently. When Ellie draws their attention to her via gunshots, she uses her pistol, but Joel has brought a rifle along for this entire journey, so why not use that? Using the rifle provides multiple advantages. Primarily, it allows Ellie to fire from a further distance and with more accuracy. Her hunting has proven that while she's not the most skilled marksman, she can kill a slow enough target. David and his men are trying to be stealthy, so they enter the neighborhood slowly. These few moments are the perfect opportunity for Ellie to hold up inside any other house and fire away. In reality, she only has one shot before the men scatter, but if she plays her cards right, that shot will give her one less target to worry about. If she has to choose, go for David. He's the leader, and the starving, confused father followers might be less inclined to kill her once their leader is dead. After her position is compromised, Ellie can still use the bandage of that house to attempt to take more of the gang out. After that, she can switch to the pistol for more agility and close-range gunfire. Here, she can use the horse in multiple ways. One option is to release the horse as a distraction to the group and shoot at them while they're confused about where the threat is coming from. The better option is to have the horse waiting nearby, and as soon as she kills David, hop on the animal and become a swiftly moving target, much like she ended up doing. With their leader dead and their target difficult to kill, the men will undoubtedly struggle, and taking more casualties might not be worth it. Even if this is not what happens, Ellie is now in a much better position to fight off the attackers because she planned out her offense rather than being taken by surprise. In the basement, Joel wakes up as he hears movement from upstairs. One of David's men has entered the house and spots the out-of-place furniture. He pushes it back to reveal the stairs to the basement. He makes his way down and spots the mattress where Joel slept, but it's empty. Looking around, the man is suddenly attacked from behind. They struggle as the man tries to turn his gun on Joel, but he stabs him in the neck and they both collapse to the ground. In town, Ellie wakes up in a cell and sees David, who tells her that he will not harm her if she joins him. She refuses to join as he starts asking her questions about herself and she insists that her protector will come for her. David assures her they will find the man, and after that, she will be alone, unless she changes her mind. In the neighborhood, another member of the group searches the backyards of houses and stumbles upon the body of his friend. Suddenly, 
Joel attacks and knocks the man out. Later, he wakes up restrained to a piano, while Joel holds a knife over his friend, who's tied to a chair. The man says he doesn't know anything about Ellie, so Joel stabs him in the knee. He asks again, and this time the man tells him she's been taken into town. Joel rips the knife out of his knee and sticks it in his mouth. He tells him to use it to point to the town on the map, but promises that if he gives a different answer than his friend, Joel will kill them both. The man does what Joel asks before the survivor fatally stabs him in the stomach. He walks to the other man who begs for his life, but Joel bludges him to death. Meanwhile, Ellie tries to unlock her cell when she notices a human ear on the floor and realizes what these people have been eating to survive. At that moment, David walks in with food, but the girl kicks it away, screaming at him that he's a cannibal. He admits that recently, he has switched the group over to human meat without telling them, but only because their supplies have run out. Trying to appeal to her, David tells Ellie that he senses a leader within her strong resolve and violent nature. He insists it's these qualities that have convinced him she should join him in leading the group, and promises to spare Joel if she does. Ellie gets close to David and places her hands around his in between the cell bars. Then, she snaps back one of his fingers, breaking it. In the scuffle, she tries and fails to grab his keys. Furious, he runs out of the room, clutching his injured finger. Outside, Joel staggers into the town. He makes his way into a building and finds Ellie's backpack, then sees the headless corpses of the town's dead strung up to dry. At the same time, David storms back into the cell room with James and grabs a hold of the girl, intending on butchering her. Ellie panics and screams that she She's infected. Both men pause and David calls her a liar, but she tells them to check her arm. He sets down his butcher's knife and pulls back her sleeve to reveal the bite. David's own hand is bleeding from Ellie biting him, and James backs away from them both. Ellie grabs the butcher knife and swings it into James's neck. She runs out of the room with David on her trail. She makes it into the dining area and tries to escape out the front door, but it's locked. Heading back into the kitchen, she grabs a smoldering log from the grill and hides in the dining room. When David enters, she chucks the wood at him and he ducks out of the way. But it lands next to a curtain, setting it on fire. David debates on putting out the flames, but decides to find Ellie first. She sneaks around the room looking for a way out, but all the doors are locked. David taunts her, revealing he has the key as the building starts to burn. Sneaking into the kitchen, she finds a knife and prepares to attack. When David gets close enough to her hiding place, she lunges at him and stabs the man in his side. He drops his meat cleaver and throws her to the ground. As he stumbles forward, Ellie spots the butcher's knife under a table, but can't quite reach it. That's when David climbs on top of her, stopping the girl as she screams for help, as David tells her that he's going to enjoy what happens next. Ellie grabs the knife and swings it straight into the man's head. His body falls down to the floor and the girl stabs his body repeatedly until he's dead. Stumbling out of the building, Ellie walks out into the snow when Joel grabs her by the shoulder, who in her state of panic does not realize who he is. She fights him, but he holds her until Ellie understands that she's safe. He reassures the girl that he'll keep her safe and gives her his coat before the two head towards the edge of town. Several years ago, a woman runs through the woods. She nearly falls down, grabbing at her pregnant stomach and looking behind her. Something is coming. She reaches the edge of the woods and enters an open field. In the middle of it is a large house, which she scrambles to. She gets inside and calls out for someone she expects to be there, but gets no answer. That's when she feels her water break and panics, knowing the baby is about to arrive. The woman runs upstairs and barricades herself in a room, using a chair to block the door. Sitting in the corner, she begins to experience contractions, but suddenly someone pushes against the door. The woman pulls out a switchblade and prepares to defend herself. An infected bursts through and lunges at the woman. She pushes it away repeatedly, avoiding its bite, until she manages to stab it in the neck, and it falls over dead. The woman looks down and sees her baby on the floor, fully out of her womb. She looks at her own leg and sees a bite from the infected. Frantically, she cuts the umbilical cord and holds her baby, whom she names Ellie. That night, Marlene, the leader of the Rebel Firefly group, enters the house with a few soldiers. They make their way upstairs and find the mother holding her baby in one arm, singing to the infant. The mother asks Marlene to take the child and get it to safety, then come back and kill her so she doesn't turn into an infected. The woman explains the umbilical cord was cut before she was bitten by the infected, but Marlene sees through her lies. The mother begs her to take the child, so Marlene finally does, not seeing another option. She gives the infant to a soldier, then shoots the mother. Years later, Ellie waits for Joel to finish scrounging for supplies. She's traumatized from her experience in Colorado. 
Joel comes back and offers her some food, trying to cheer her up. It doesn't work, so they instead just continue their trek into Salt Lake City, hoping to find the fireflies. They make their way into the city, and Joel decides to go to the top of a skyscraper. When they find the passage up is blocked, Joel gives Ellie a boost to another level. As soon as she gets up, she sees something and runs off. Following after her as fast as he can, Joel manages to make his way up to her, and follows her as she springs around the building, finally coming to an opening in the wall. The giraffe walks up to the building, and Joel encourages Ellie to feed it leaves. As she interacts with the animal, Ellie comes back to life and she's happy again, getting out of her slump. Later, Joel and Ellie make their way through more streets, heading towards the hospital they think the fireflies are located in. They pass through an abandoned emergency medical camp. Joel explains to Ellie that the government implemented these at the start of the outbreak, but most shut down soon after. Curious, she asks about the stitches on his forehead. He tells her that after his daughter Sarah was killed on the first day of the outbreak, he lost his will to live. On day two of the outbreak, he almost gave up but flinched and the bullet grazed him. The emergency medical personnel were able to save his life, leaving him with only a small scar 20 years later. Joel and Ellie continue walking, listening to more of her puns, but behind them, soldiers approach. One tosses a smoke grenade that knocks them both to the ground, and a soldier butts Joel in the head with his gun, knocking him out. When he wakes up, Joel's on a hospital bed being watched over by two guards. Marlene enters and tells him that the soldiers did not mean to hurt him. They simply did not know who he was and took necessary precautions. He asks where Ellie is, and Marlene is reluctant to give information until finally, she tells him the girl's being safely prepared for surgery. Though weak, Joel begins to question why she's going into surgery. Marlene says that the Firefly doctors believe that because her mother was bitten by an infected while giving birth, Ellie has a small, harmless strand of cordyceps within her. When she got bit as a teenager, the harmless cordyceps convinced the regular cordyceps that she was already infected, so she never turned into a zombie. The doctor hopes to take these cordyceps from her body and use them to create a vaccine. Joel suddenly understands, cordyceps is located within a human's brain. In order to create the vaccine, the doctor will have to remove parts of Ellie's brain. Before he can do anything, Marlene orders the soldiers to take him to the highway, give him Ellie's switchblade, and abandon them. The soldiers begin taking Joel out of the hospital. As they pass a floor sign, he takes note of what level the surgery bays are on. In the stairwell, he keeps pausing, agitating the soldier. Then, he turns around and tackles him. He uses the soldier's gun to shoot the other, then turns the gun on the soldier. He shoots him in the leg and asks where Ellie is being kept. When the soldier doesn't answer, Joel shoots him in the head. He makes his way out of the stairs and towards the surgery floor. He methodically walks through the hospital, killing Firefly soldiers without a second thought. He creeps towards the surgery room, switching out his rifle for the handgun of a dead soldier. He enters the surgery room just as the nurse tells the doctor that Ellie is ready. The girl lies unconscious on the operating table, and Joel tells him to stop, panicking the nurse. The doctor steps forward in protest, but Joel immediately shoots him in the head. The nurses scream as Joel tells them to unhook Ellie from the monitors. As soon as they do, he scoops her body into his arm and leaves the nurses with their lives. He takes Ellie to the parking garage, and there he finds a car getting its battery charged. As he steps towards it, Marlene steps out of the shadows with her gun drawn. She begs Joel to give Ellie back to the Fireflies. She's all of humanity's last hope to return to a cordyceps-free civilization. Joel questions where the humanity is for Ellie, and giving her no choice but to sacrifice her life. Marlene argues that it's too important to give Ellie a choice, but that if she had one, she would choose to help others. Joel shoots Marlene in the stomach, sending her crashing to the ground. He puts Ellie in the back of the car, then walks back over. Marlene asks to be spared, but Joel says he knows the only thing she'll do is come looking for them again, and he kills her. In the morning, Ellie stirs in the back seat. Joel calms her down and tells her that she's safe. When she asks what happened, Joel lies, saying that the Fireflies found they could not use her immunity to create a cure. They found many others immune like her, but no medical success in creating a vaccine. Then a raider group attacked the hospital, and Joel barely managed to get them both out alive. Ellie asks about Marlene. Joel avoids the question, and she gathers what his silence means. She turns over and goes back to sleep. Later, the car overheats and stops running. Joel and Ellie have made it to Wyoming, and he tells her that a few-hour hike will get them back to Tommy's commune in safety. Ellie gets dressed in newly scavenged clothes, and the two start walking. During the hike, Joel tells Ellie he thinks she would have gotten along with his daughter. They were both kind, funny souls. He tries his best to remind himself that Ellie is not his daughter, but cannot help but to think it. Towards dusk, they reach the final hill above the valley of the commune. Joel marches forward, but Ellie stops him. She explains that back in the mall with her friend Riley, after they each got bitten, she had to kill her best friend before discovering she was immune to the cordyceps. Then, every step of this journey has led to someone's death. She wonders is it worth it for Joel to stay with her. 
he reassures her that in times like these, the best a person can hope to do is survive and find something new to fight for. He will do that for Ellie if she lets him. She asks him to swear that everything he has told her about the hospital, the fireflies, and the cure is true. He swears it. Ellie looks up at him and agrees to go on. But what do you think? How would you beat The Last of Us Season 1 Part 2? Let me know in the comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this, and don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.